Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's sessions. session, Lessons for Us All from the Development of the F-35 Fighter Jet. My name is Haley Hart, and I'm joined by our presenter, Billy Hollis. You are currently muted. There will be time for a Q&A after the presentation. In the meantime, you can post uh, to the Q&A or chat areas on your screen. As always, if you have tech issues, you can contact classes at synergex.com. And um, this session is being recorded, uh, so you'll have access to it after the conference ends. Now let's get into it. I am very, very pleased to introduce our presenter today, Billy Hollis. Billy has been developing software for over 30 years and has acquired a worldwide reputation in software development and architecture. As a developer and consultant, he has developed systems for healthcare, energy, telecommunications, and human resources. As an author, he has written or co-written 10 technology books and dozens of magazine articles. As a conference speaker, he has spoken to thousands of software developers at the largest industry events in the Microsoft space, including TechEd, DevConnections, and VS Live. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Billy Hollis here. As we draw to the end of the Synergex conference, how about a little change of pace? We're all in the business of developing software. Sometimes, of course, we make mistakes and hopefully learn from those mistakes. But it's a lot cheaper to learn from other people's mistakes. Here's a good place to do that. I recently saw this article on the development of the F-35 fighter jet. Now, that's the kind of project on which you'd really like to avoid major mistakes, don't you think? Yes, well, they made some whoppers, and the article talks about some of the big ones. What bothers me about these mistakes is that they're all preventable. In fact, they're all in categories a lot of us already know about. I rant about these mistakes all the time. In fact, I'm afraid people start to think of me as a bit of a crank. But I can't stop talking about them because these kinds of mistakes are bad for our companies, our users, and us personally. The three I want to highlight from this article are bad architectures, bad UX, which can lead to catastrophic consequences, and trying to be cool instead of trying to be useful. There are lots of ways to write software badly, but one of the most common is code bloat. And the F-35 has some serious bloat. Earlier generations of fighters had about a million lines of code in their systems. The F-35 has 8 million. Most of you have worked with bloated systems at some point, and I bet you can name the problems that come out of it, namely lots of bugs and very hard maintenance. I wasn't on the F-35 team, but based on my experience looking at dozens of corporate systems, I'd venture the biggest single reason for the bloat and the bugs is the current code-slinging culture in software development. What I mean by code slinging is that a majority of developers in the industry at this point think of software development from a very code-centric attitude. They consider it their job to write code, not to do architecture or design, or even to ensure app reliability. They're supposed to write code to implement whatever feature someone tells them they need to develop. Developers worry too much about code and not enough about other aspects that contribute to excellent software development particularly architecture. Some of our biggest successes over the years are when we found good architectural ways to get functionality with a whole lot less code than anybody expected. If this is such an obvious problem, how did we get here? Well, software development platforms get more complex all the time, whether it's massive frameworks like Java and .NET, or cobbling together a plethora of JavaScript frameworks, it's a tremendous coding challenge to make a sophisticated app work at all. Doing so takes some real coding skills. Researching and understanding APIs, syntactical features of one or more languages, usually more than one these days. Mastery of a coding environment like Visual Studio, it's really, really hard. One of the consequences is that the vast majority of the people who develop software these days have succeeded in the industry because of their coding skills. They therefore tend to put the vast majority of their own emphasis on those skills. Now, we do need some great coders to cope with the complexity. 
However, there are other skills that contribute to great software, and I see many of them being neglected. For example, I continue to be surprised at the haphazard architectures I see in many modern applications. Their architecture, to the extent that they have any, usually wasn't designed. It just sort of grew by accretion as the system evolved. And poor architectures are one of the reasons for code bloat. Different coders working on similar problems are more likely, when you have a bad architecture, to write their own code, leading to redundancy. Current software development practices often don't solve this problem and might even make it worse. Code-centric developers like agile methodologies, and I understand why. Agile makes responsibilities pretty clear and helps developers know what they need to do next. It also helps keep them accountable and not spinning on a problem without asking for help. But I see articles like this one. And I conclude that while Agile is a reasonable choice for getting code out, the bigger picture is more complex. Here we see that over half of CIOs in Britain think Agile is discredited. And a lot of them seem to think it's become a racket. When people at this level are seeing problems like that, it means things are not going perfectly. It's my opinion that one cause of this displeasure is that Agile tends to give short shrift to design and architecture. Of course, a lot of Agile proponents would claim that it means teams are not doing Agile right, and they may be correct, but it still means that just doing something that is described as Agile does not necessarily protect you from developing bad apps. Architecture isn't coding, so I suggest that if you use Agile, Make sure overall big picture architecture gets enough attention. That might mean taking it outside the agile process. It's my firm opinion that one of the reasons a million lines of code in earlier fighter jets ballooned to 8 million lines for the F-35 was poor architecture. It can bite you too. So to avoid code bloat and bugs, do it right. A great book on creating good architecture is called Writing Software, echoing that sentiment to do it right. It was published a few months ago. It's by Yuval Loy, a longtime colleague of mine. If you suspect your team could boost their architecture game, this is a good place to start. He also teaches a master class in architecture that's highly respected. Also, the folks at Synergex are happy to discuss new architectures for new generations of your software. I've had some good talks with them, and their general principles for architecture match my own teams pretty well. Now let's talk about how poor UX design can have catastrophic fallout. When designing interactions for any system, it's a temptation to copy a design from somewhere else, and sometimes this works fine. But sometimes transplanting a design leads to some very unintended side effects and problems. When the F-35 team designed the controls of their fighter, they made that precise mistake. And here's the result. I don't normally read right off of slides, but these two sentences are too good to miss. The fighter jet also suffers from a slightly embarrassing touchscreen problem. After making the switch from hard flip switches to touchscreens, pilots report that unlike a physical switch, that you're confident has been activated. Touch screens in the plane don't work 20% of the time, says one F-35 pilot. That's pretty bad. So how did that come about? Well, I can easily imagine the meeting where the touch screen decision was made. I can just imagine a guy saying, touch screens are the future. They're programmable. This is an advanced fighter generation. It's time to get away from those primitive toggle switches. So how do you avoid falling into this trap? Well, a good first step is to put yourself into the mind of the user while they are doing their job. In this case, visualize flying a fighter jet. Consider all the things you have to keep track of. Now, imagine you have to turn something on and how it would work with a physical switch versus a touch screen. Now, with training, you don't have to look at the toggle switch or at most just a sideways glance. You can feel when you have it and when you've changed it, but a touch screen requires you to look at the screen to locate it among the other controls, and it offers no tactile feedback. Without looking, you don't even know if you are turning it on or off. 
there are several good design practices to avoid traps like that. Have a good understanding of the environment and the tasks that must be carried out in it. But all of those depend on understanding the user. For example, consider the safety considerations. Compare an F-35 pilot to a typical touchscreen user. An iPad user suffers negligible consequences if that button they thought was clicked wasn't, and they have to come back a few seconds later and click it again. A fighter pilot in a life-or-death situation does not have that luxury. Most of your users are likely somewhere in the middle. They're not typically in life-or-death situations, but they're not just watching videos and missing the pause button either. What they're doing is important, and therefore it's important for them to know they've done it correctly. You should consciously consider the consequences of significant change in app interaction and the things that might go wrong. What would it mean for your company if someone entering an order that is necessary for a customer's production process thought that it went through, but the software didn't think that it went through? What kind of ripple effects and costs would there be? Now, you shouldn't wait for a major crisis to arise before you realize that you have a problem to solve, like, unfortunately, these folks did. For those of you who don't know the backstory, a department of the state of Hawaii accidentally activated a statewide alert for an imminent incoming nuclear attack. You can imagine the chaos that resulted from that. They intended to activate a drill for that event. But as you can see, the app page they use for these drills is atrocious. I don't really care who the developer was who did this. They should be ashamed and swear that they will never create a user interface again for the rest of their lives. This is a train wreck of bad design. The immediate problem that caused the mistake is that the user pressed the option next to the top arrow instead of the similarly named drill at the bottom arrow. Now, why is the, the actual event higher than the drill, which is much more commonly used? Look, any competent designer and most competent developers could create a far better interface in only an hour or so. It would take just a few minutes to rearrange the page and put in some color to tip off the user about what they were doing. Look, it's just not that hard to grasp the design principle that related things need to be close together and spacing should be used to separate unrelated groups. By the way, the spacing and grouping principle I just described is known in the design world as gestalt proximity. There is a lot of interesting stuff out there on design principles like that one. Design principles are one of the foundations of doing better UX design. If you're interested, I have a four-hour course on Pluralsight about design principles. And you can watch a video of a session I did in London last year called, What Do Users Really See? Well, I just discovered that my recording software switched to the wrong low-quality microphone without telling me a while back. I just switched it back, so my voice probably sounds better now. As you've seen, one of my themes today is helping you find ways to avoid some of these mistakes that others have made. One important step for that is vetting your designs properly, evaluating them and ensuring that they really do fit your circumstances. This is especially important for designs that include radical change, like that switch from physical switches to touchscreen buttons we discussed earlier. Any such major changes should be thoroughly vetted before a final decision to implement them. Vetting includes exposing your design to users and other stakeholders. You can do that with prototyping, and for most business apps, that's enough. But for platform changes and radically new interfaces, and for important apps with a large user base, it might be a good idea to go on to do usability testing. This means more investment because writing a prototype to show is much easier than writing a semi-functional prototype that users can sit down and interact with. Another key to good vetting is to have multiple design candidates whenever possible. When users are looking at two or more possibilities, you'll find that they focus much better on how each one fits their job. You'll get much better feedback if you offer multiple design options, especially for the major pieces of functionality. Effective vetting like this can be tricky. 
how do you know when the user doesn't like the radical change because it's not a good fit versus not liking it because they tend to prefer what they already know? This is called status quo bias, and it sometimes results in unreasonable resistance to new things replacing old things. If your new design really is good, pushing radical change against user resistance can yield great outcomes and high value. So don't just give up on a new innovative design because users don't react well at first. As with most things in design, you have to achieve a balance between doing new things and accommodating user preference for old things. This example of a touchscreen versus physical switch in the F35 Jet. It's also an illustration of my third rant point, one of the most dangerous phrases in the entire technology industry is, wouldn't it be cool if? I warn students in my design classes to regard it as a red flag when anyone involved in the design or development processes says this. Technophiles have a higher tolerance than most users for technology that just feels cool to them. They often overlook its potential problems, partially because they want the experience of working with that new technology. I have no doubt that the concept of touchscreens and fighter jets felt cool to the design team. They got to break new ground in redesigning for an old need. But that impulse to forge ahead with touchscreens should have been questioned much earlier and only parts of the cockpit that were well suited to touch screens should have used that technology. The problem of wouldn't it be cool if looks widespread in this entire F-35 project. Here's how a senior Air Force official put it. Amid all these challenges, Air Force Chief Brown compared the F-35 to a Ferrari. He said, you don't drive your Ferrari to work every day. You only drive it on Sundays. This is our high-end fighter. We want to make sure we don't use it all for the low-end fight, he said in a press conference on February 17. In a nutshell, Brown wants to limit how often the F-35 is being used and then develop a less advanced replacement. Sounds to me as though the F-35 has lots of cool stuff in it, but the result isn't optimized for day-to-day -day usage as a fighter jet. But I don't think all those billions were spent to get pilots a Ferrari-level jet that can't be used routinely. I also think putting in too much cool stuff almost certainly was a major factor in this lack of optimization for routine use. What if you created your next generation app and it was really cool, but it was so clunky for a big part of your work that your users kept having to use the old system more than the new? Uh, how would you like to go to the people who signed the checks for, for the development of that app and say, well, we were creating a Ferrari type software that people shouldn't use all the time. What kind of reaction would you get? I've actually seen a real world scenario a lot like that. Before I came in to help, one client of mine spent 18 months creating a browser-based replacement for an old AS400 application. Modern, browser-based, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Cool, right? But the users hated it so much and it fit their job so poorly that in less than a week, they demanded to return to the old AS400 app. The new cool browser-based app was tossed in the bit bucket because it simply didn't fit what the users needed, no matter how cool it was. For those excited about technology, there's a temptation to do stuff that's cool with practically no concern with whether a user really cares or benefits. Here's an example from about four years ago called Story Remix from Microsoft. This was introduced as a big deal. It was a major demo in a keynote at their 2017 Build Conference, which is generally the biggest event each year for the future of Windows and Azure. Things that make it into the keynote are supposed to be an important innovation from Microsoft. What was the important innovation in it? Well, the demo in the keynote, remember, was about putting explosions in home videos. Seriously, let me show you my own video that basically replicates their demo. Here's the original 
video that I'm going to use. It's about 16 seconds, and it's of a funny reload animation that somebody made for a video game. And you'll see it in just a moment here. There's the gun sort of bites the cartridge that goes into it, which, okay, that's pretty funny. Now, let me take that and put an explosion in it. And 3D effects. Oh, it, it, it changes, by the way, to a different screen, and I have to put that on your, over here. Yes, continue. Now, there's my 3D effects, and you can see an explosion there. So if I go to the right place in the, in the, the video, which is kind of where the gun's gonna be firing, then uh, I can put an explosion where the bullet supposedly hits. There's an explosion. Yeah, okay, I'll put it over just a little bit. And I think it's probably all right like that. And now if I go back to the beginning of the video and play it, and you see, there we go. I've got an explosion in my video. The demo back in 2017 was basically the same, except they put the explosion in a kid's soccer game. You can see a photo someone took of the demo on stage on this slide. I remember sitting in the audience at that keynote back when we attended conferences in person, remember? Anyway, I remember sitting there watching the demo and thinking, that's stupid. Nobody who's a serious user of Windows cares about putting explosions into their videos. But explosions are cool, right? Ah, who cares? It was an absolute waste. Those development dollars could have been spent far more productively. I mean, here we are, four years later. How many of you have been avid users of Story Remix? How many of you even realized it existed? Uh, not very many, I'd wager. And here's the funny part. That demo I just did is in the latest version of Windows. Story Remix is in Windows right now as part of the Photos app. They didn't throw it away. They just kind of hid it so they wouldn't be embarrassed about it. Plus, somebody's middle school kid probably really likes it for his class projects. Here, let me show you where it is. You go in the Photos app, and I did this pretty quickly in the actual demo. I'll, I'll take a little more time now. You go to Edit and Create, and then you pick Add 3D Effects. Now, when you do that, you get that other screen that I had. Let me go pick that up for you. There it is. And that screen is the one that actually lets you put the 3D effects in and play it back and see what the results are. And then there you see you can save a copy of your video with explosions in it. It isn't just explosions. There are a whole lot of effects. Let's make this window bigger so you can see. You can put atomic motion and, oh, you know, I don't know, balloons and stuff in it. So there are a lot of gratuitous, unimportant things that they created for the demo, and they just kind of let it flow. Four years later, it's still in Windows. But nobody cared about it from the beginning, and really nobody of consequence cares about it now. The lesson for you is to be careful as you move to new platforms. Many of you are in the middle of a transition to more modern UI, or at least thinking about it. The temptation to do cool things will be high. You will talk yourself into believing that making your new app cool will be the way to convince your users to use it. Here's a story about another Synergex user that illustrates this. I was evaluating an app developed by a longtime Synergex client. It had a page flipping animation in it. That's one of those things that looks cool the first time you see it, but quickly becomes annoying. <laughs> I walked up to the projector screen, pointed to it and said, don't do that. And everyone in the room started laughing, except the, for the president of the company. It had been his idea. I still see gratuitous animations, even in browser-based applications. To someone who has been dealing with UI technology from the 90s, well, they look cool. But they're not, especially to modern user audiences. Just to be clear now, animations can contribute to a good user experience, but they need to be appropriate and generally subtle. Flashy, garish animations are virtually always a bad idea. In fact, striving to be cool in general is almost always a mistake. And if you're not already convinced, here is a major and expensive example of why. This mistake cost Microsoft billions of dollars. It's Windows 8. 
When I saw it at the public rollout in 2011, I was highly skeptical. It seemed to be different for the sake of being different and clearly violated some important design principles. Fortunately, I didn't have to be the one to explain this to Microsoft. One of the foremost interaction designers in the world, Jakob Nielsen, explained it to them in this 2012 article. Why did Microsoft get it so wrong? Well, remember what was going on. In 2010, as Windows 8 was being designed, the iPad was taking off in a big way. Everyone thought the iPad was cool, but the coolness wasn't the reason it was a success. It succeeded because it was so incredibly easy to use and opened up devices to a new category of unsophisticated users. Microsoft saw that it was cool and thought the way to compete was to be even more cool. But let's be honest about this, Microsoft doesn't do cool that well. So they went with garish colors and minimalist design, which it turned out nobody liked and nobody understood. See, when your software is, seems like it's waving a flag and trying to get your attention, that's almost always an indication that it's badly designed. If it's going, look at me, I'm cool, then really it's probably not cool. It's just flashy. Especially for business apps, users don't want flashy. They want help with their jobs. Even if something flashy catches their attention at first, they'll quickly get tired of it as they use it every day. One way Microsoft tried to be flashy was using garish colors. I call them Power Ranger colors at the time because they were bright and meaningless. Apparently, colors for app tiles were chosen at random. And there's another lesson for you. If you're going to use color in your next generation app, keep it subtle and make it meaningful. It's also important to design to the range of users that you have. Windows 8 astonished me because the main shell had no concept of app folders. They just dumped apps, hundreds of them, onto the same screen. If it weren't for the search function that I've got circled there in the upper right, it would be somewhere between difficult and impossible to find most apps. The Windows team was convinced that folders were not needed and users didn't understand them anyway. Well, traditional Windows users understood them quite well. And they're apparently understandable enough that iOS and the latest versions have simple folders for the app screen. There's a design principle failure on this screen that comes out of the lack of folders. The design principle is called Hicks Law, and it's one of the most common design principle violations in business apps. It has to do with the way too many options slows down users. You should pay special attention to Hicks Law when you do your next generation of app. Otherwise, you'll slow down your users and in some cases, prevent them from doing something because they simply can't find where to do it. You should carefully design the system of navigation and the options in a new app. And don't just keep sticking things on a menu until you're done. We've talked about various UX mistakes inspired by the problems found in F35 development. We've also looked at some of the ways you can avoid making similar mistakes in your own development. Let's look briefly at some final high-level ways you can prevent many of the mistakes we've discussed. For example, it's a good idea to match the level of design effort to the importance of your application. Let me talk a little bit about what I mean. In this diagram, I've tried to show how more intense forms of design yield more value. The more important your project is, the more important your app is to your company, the further to the right you'll probably want to go in this diagram of blocks. And I like to make this clear because the term design is overloaded and it means different things to different people. I think it's helpful for anyone thinking about design in software development to understand something about the various levels of design. The first level most teams take up is primarily around layout and aesthetics, choosing the right colors and such. But the amount of value you get from aesthetics is limited. Oh, sure, there's some. Nobody wants to look at an ugly app. And good layout helps users work faster. But you can typically get more value by doing more intense design, such as doing data visualizations. That kind of design is typically confined to a certain section of an app. 
visualization might be needed in a pane in a dashboard, for example, or in a decision sports screen. It helps qu people quickly make good decisions, and that has more value than aesthetics. Moving further up, we've talked a lot today about interaction design. Doing that right means getting navigation and interaction for the user right. This both speeds up users and reduces the errors they make. It involves how different views in the app relate to one another. So it's a more sophisticated form of design than designing a standalone piece of an app. However, when you're moving to a new generation of application, this is an excellent time to also do some design thinking around the workflows in your company. Some of your workflows might be inefficient because of technical constraints when they were created. So now is your chance to design new workflows without those constraints and implement them in your new application. Uh, by the way, that form of design thinking can often benefit from having an outsider look at your workflows. People who have been using exi existing workflows for years often find it hard to imagine doing things any other way. Also, as I've mentioned a few times, make sure real users are heavily involved in your process of design and vetting the designs before you put them into production. And try to come up with multiple approaches to a design so that users can choose the one that fits their job. Design can have a major impact on the returns your app can generate. I talked to some of you about this at a Synergex conference for management and team leaders about 18 months ago. And in fact, I did a spreadsheet that is useful for a first cut approximation of the money you could be leaving on the table with suboptimal design. For any of you who have not seen it, I'd be happy to show you the spreadsheet with your own numbers filled in. You can just ping me at billy at nextver.com or you can download the spreadsheet and take a whack at it yourself. The F35 project could have clearly benefited from a world-class architect to keep code on track and a world-class designer to prevent overuse of cool stuff and make the designs more suitable for the intended user, namely the pilot and the tasks needed by that user. It's likely that such assets being added to the project could have saved hundreds of billions of dollars. Well, of course, for projects like that, such savings are difficult or even impossible because of competing political demands. But most of you don't have that problem. So take these lessons to heart. You might prevent some big problems and save a lot of money too. The general theme today has been to think through the design and architecture of your apps before you build them. Don't sling code just because that's a comfortable thing to do. Design a good architecture and get help if you need to. The Synergex folks are an obvious choice there. Do innovation with new technologies, but make sure those innovations fit the needs of your users. Don't do things just because they're cool. Work with your users and design experiences that fit their jobs and their needs. If you need help with that, set up a discussion with me and I'll suggest some approaches. Well, I hope you've had a bit of fun today and carried away a few lessons that will help in your own software development. As you can probably tell from how I get carried away by design stuff, I love to do it. And if you need it, you can contact me to discuss options. Also, I do a few free web meetings each month, talking to individual companies about various design topics. Check in with me if you're interested in that. At this point, we're ready to move to live Q&A, so pass any questions you like along to the moderator if you've not already done so. Um, okay, our first question comes from David Williams, and David says, at what level would you suggest involving users in the design of the software? Before any code gets written, or when you have some kind of prototype to put in front of them? Oh, definitely before any code gets written at all, because in order to design an effective um, a prototype, or, or even before that, I, I tend to recommend doing sketches and such before you do a prototype and doing some rounds of showing that to the user. But the essential foundation for, for doing any kind of design really is an understanding of the user's psychology, what, what they're like as a person, because they tend not to be very much like developers. So understanding a little bit about what they're going to understand and what they're not. And, um, understanding what the key things that will speed them up are. 
And the best way to find that out is to observe them doing their jobs using the old system or whatever paper-based system that they happen to be using. Observe that. And I have a, see, I, I, I have to resist the temptation to lapse into lecture mode here because I have a very <laughs> long process that I, we tend to go through, especially when we're talking about changing platforms. And I tell you what, let me find the link for that, for the, the paper that's got that, that would talk about that. Hang on just a second. Uh, because this is the, the document that I use in the design classes that I teach. And it mm -hmm. walks through the entire design process. So let's see here. Um, oops. Get my thing to come on now. There we go. Um, if you need yeah. a second to find it, um, oh, I no, can I, also... I found it right there. I, I, I thought oh, I found perfect. it pretty quick. Let's All dump right. that probably into the chat window, I guess is probably the best. Yeah, perfect. All right, mm -hmm. let's put that in there. It's a, a bitly note. So it's relatively easy to copy if you need to there. But that's about a 20 page document, 19, 20 pages. And it steps through what I view as the optimal process. Now, the optimal process does vary depending upon the importance of the app, the complexity of the app, the number of users, whether or not it's logistically feasible to talk to them. And the document tends to go through that. But talking to users up front is, to me, essential in doing true, innovative and effective design. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. So our next question comes from uh, Tim Laverne. And Tim says, do you suggest having UX specialists or should we be grooming all developers and analysts to be UX centric? That Well, that's one of those it depends questions of which there are quite a, quite a number of those in design. I do recommend that developers understand some of the basic sensibilities about design. I think that's good for them. You, you remember the blocks that I had, uh, especially that second block when you're designing a little piece of an app for a data visualization and thing, things like that. Um, in many cases, a lot of teams just don't have designers to do that. They don't have dedicated design specialists. So it falls on to developers to do it. The, the, the catchphrase that I use there is if you are creating user interfaces, then you're doing design whether you like that idea or not. So understanding some of the basics, I think, is good. I also think it's good for a developer to do that because it builds their own talent stack. It makes them sort of a, a multiple threat in terms of, of doing, doing good work, doing good high value work. But there are certainly cases as you move up the complexity curve where getting some, some dedicated design expertise is probably a better choice. Uh, platform shifts is one of the biggest. It's extremely unlikely that you can take an existing team and then advance them, oh, 10, 15, 20 or more years in the future to a completely different platform and a completely different way of thinking about UX. It's unlikely that you can do that and get effective results without bringing somebody out in from the outside who, who understands the new platform, who has seen other applications on the new platform and can assist. In general, remember those blocks, the, the, the further up to the taller blocks you go, the more outside help will, will help you. But don't ignore design sensibilities just because you don't have a resource. Certainly there are, are aspects of it that developers can learn. In fact, one of the classes I teach at conferences and such is an introduction to design for developers. And I have a course on LinkedIn for that. I didn't put that in, in, in my other course. I didn't, I didn't want to seem overly self-promoting, but if you go on LinkedIn, there is a course there that I did called UX design for developers. And it's only about an hour and a half and, and it, covers some of the most essential principles for developers to begin thinking a little bit more about design. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And um, oh, Tim, I, I, he's got the follow up there, right? Yeah, he's um, got the follow up. Mm -hmm. How do uh, you promote consistent UX design across multiple teams? That That is very tricky. And, and it, it depends on how big the team is. If the team is small enough, they can, they can come to that consistency on their own. But one of my enterprise clients, has about 150 developers scattered on four or five teams. And we worked with one team and, and got everything consistent on that team and everything is fine. But the other teams, they look at those apps and they go, well, those are co cool. They're nice. They're, they're effective. They fit the jobs, but they then don't try to be the least bit consistent with that. 
On the other hand, I have um, another enterprise client in, in Minneapolis that uh, had, had, I think they had about a dozen different teams of which I did training for seven of them and followed the training up with their initial design experience. To, they were moving to a new platform and kind of challenged them to do that. It, the more of the team that goes through a design process, the more likely it is that you'll get some consistency. Uh, and, and one of the keys to that is studying those design principles actually has a side benefit that might not be immediately apparent. If you understand something about design principles, you understand why the design works the way it does. See, developers don't like touchy feely approaches to design. So if they just see a design, they don't necessarily know why the design team put some things in there. Uh, some of the principles that, that sent them in a given direction, they don't really get that. So they feel very open to just ignoring that and well, I think I have a better way to do it. So one of the ways to get some consistency is to have everybody on the team at least get to the level where they understand, let's call it the dozen or two dozen most important design principles uh, that if you violate them, you're probably going to get a, a suboptimal design. And that's no more than a day or two days at the most of time. You can do more and learn more about process and such, but just to understand the principles is maybe a day that they spend doing video stuff. And, and I do online seminars on that and I do that sort of thing at conferences. So getting as much of the team as possible to go through understanding those design principles is a really good step in getting some consistency. Great, thank you very much. Um, all right, and ah, Eric, I just saw you posted the link that Thomas recommended. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a question from Jim McKenney. Uh, Jim says, hi, Billy, what are your current thoughts on some of the newer Windows technologies in UI3, WASM, et cetera? Well, um, they finally made some of those technologies. They finally gotten at the point that I would actually feel comfortable putting them into some projects and and earlier versions of when you I, I didn't feel that way and i was particularly upset with xaml islands which i thought was just just a horribly done technology back when they first and it was one of those things in a bill keynote that was supposed to be a really big deal but they finally have gotten to the point where i would feel okay about putting some of that stuff in um especially if if you're looking at, at a platform change um the big things that when you buys you are uh, things like far better mapping and and the the ability to write what I call hybrid apps where you've got a desktop part but you've also got a web based part mm -hmm. now you've got the uh, you've got a great browser control it's the chromium based edge browser control that you can integrate into these desktop apps and that makes a huge difference for those of you who kind of don't know what I mean by that um, up till fairly recently, the only browser component that was really available for desktop apps that used more traditional technologies like WPF was an Internet Explorer based browser. And we've really gotten to the point now where it, it, a lot of the Internet content is just never going to work there. So now we have a modern browser capability. We've got maps. Um, we've got all kinds of interesting graphical stuff. We've got some pre-written parts for some of the nice navigation and and other capabilities that, that that you'd like to put in those apps so it's at the point where especially if you're starting an application now for development i feel like this is a pretty good time to start it's solid enough that i'm okay about it and i would i would have not said that six months ago awesome thank you um so it's slightly similar to a uh, question to the one before, but I think slightly different. Um, Steve Ive says, if someone really needs to deploy an app to multiple platforms, those hybrids that you were just talking about, are there any specific UI frameworks that you would recommend? Well, um, that's a tough one because we're at a bad time. We're at a time now where we kind of were with some of that when you asked stuff six months or a year ago. There are basically, if you're going to do native kinds of things or um, non-HTML kinds of things is probably a better way of putting it. If, if that's what you want to do, there are basically two, root, two, two avenues to investigate. First of all, we've got, got this thing called WebAssembly in the browser. And WebAssembly allows you to write apps that are running in the browser, but are actually using local computing resources. And you've got the things that you accustom 
you, you normally think of, of with desktop software, things like state management and such as that. So WebAssembly is a, is a good platform for that. By all accounts, WebAssembly is, it, it, it has a lot of momentum and looks like it's going to be very important over the next, let's call it five years. I think HTML has kind of peaked in terms of, of where uh, it, some of the innovation stuff that you can do in it. You can tell that HTML was never really intended for a lot of things we make it do, which is why we've got all these JavaScript frameworks and they're constantly churning and people, you can make that work. You absolutely can make it work and a lot of people have, but it's a lot of effort. It costs more than, than desktop software. So people seeing that are, are starting to get a little bit um, upset about, about having to do all that work. And you can tell because there are so many different products out there that are challenging that HTML ish kind of way of doing things. There's things like Google flutter. There's a company called out systems as low code and, and Microsoft has their power apps. And basically you're looking at a whole range. There's about half a dozen of these major companies that are offering alternatives to traditional HTML based development. But if you're really looking at more of a native desktop kind of thing, uh, the two avenues that I think are probably worth looking at are first, they're both based on WebAssembly. Now both use WebAssembly as, as their, as their, their underlying technology in the browser. And the first is called Blazor. And that's a new, uh, it's an initiative put, put together by Microsoft that allows you to create local apps more or less that are running and de being deployed from the browser. They get deployed like web pages, but the actual execution is running pretty much there inside the browser. So you can do things like, Oh, dump a thousand records down and create a dynamic key by key, keystroke by keystroke filtering right there inside the browser, which we're used to doing that stuff in desktop software, but that was always kind of hard to do. So you can use Blazor for that. If you're more interested in multi-platform stuff, then there is a platform called the Uno platform. And basically what it does is take the syntax associated with Windows 10's universal Windows platform, the XAML, and and projects that into other other places such as the browser using WebAssembly, but it also creates apps for Android and for iOS, which means oh, and for Linux. And I guess recently they added macOS. So if multi-platform is a really big thing, and you're trying to, to to try to share as much as you can between the platforms, then Uno is pretty good for that. Now the granddaddy of that has been Xamarin. And Xamarin has been used very well. It's very mature. It, it's not, it, it doesn't produce quite as impressive a set of desktop like native like apps as the Uno platform. But certainly if you're, if you're interested in maturity, um, then, the, then, then Xamarin is probably the way to go. So those are the three things to check out now, which one you choose kind of depends on how much you need multi-platform, how fancy you need your UX to be, and kind of what is your appetite for risk. <laughs> Love it. Um, all right. A question from David Williams. David says, are there any resources that you'd recommend for minimizing the training needed for users? Yeah. Um, in general, we stopped writing documentation six or eight years ago, and, and we don't ever expect to write traditional documentation ever again for our for, for end users. Instead, what, what we find is really helpful is, is to design our applications to easily integrate 30 to 90 second videos that explain most of the features that people might stumble over. And then those recordings, those 30 sec to 90 second recordings are typically done showing the software in use. And the tool that we use for that is called Camtasia. It's actually the same thing that I shot this video with and edited it with. So Camtasia is kind of one of the, the resources you really want to have if you want to integrate any kind of video help in, in today's user population, that's just the way they expect to get help. Now there's nothing to stop you from putting tutorials on YouTubes and, and, and things like that. And that's probably a better use of resources than writing a book that nobody will read writing a, a binder. So, um, uh, in general video stuff seems to work very well. Um, but, but we often supplement that also with, a, 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 if we're doing desktop oriented applications, you have a lot of capabilities for, for hover kind of capabilities. If you're doing mouse keyboard, uh, hover ca capabilities. We also tend to use resources that, that, that come out when somebody first starts using the app. 
that they show up the first time you try to do something. You don't want them to show up all the time because the users will get irritated. But some during some initial ramp up period, we will kind of push that proactively in front of the user. And you can do that with web based software, too. Uh, but but we, we find it's really easy to do with, with desktop software. Thank you. Uh, I'm all about getting rid of uh, handbooks. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry for because look, I'm a writer and I was the guy that read the manuals and I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but I didn't hate it. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I manuals. No, but nobody reads me anymore. Cool. All right. Our next question comes from Pete Strange, winner of our $50 gift card. Um, Pete says, what are your thoughts on Google's material design? Google's material design is a pretty good starting point for a typical web-based application. It's it's clean, it's it, it feels pretty good overall, the color choices, et cetera, are okay. And the thing about that is that somebody was asking earlier about how much do, do developers need to know? Well, you'd like them not to need to know any more than necessary. So, so using supplements like Google's material design is, is a pretty good way to get a base level of aesthetics and a certain amount of interactivity in the app without the, the users without the developers rather uh, having to really know that that much about it. I, I don't think it's perfect by any means. If I were doing it, I'd do it differently. But I, I guess probably every designer on earth would say the same thing. Um, but but in general, it's pretty good. I don't think it's as good as iOS's um, um, equivalent that their their base set of controls and things like that. But it's fine. And if you want to use that as as your fundamental foundation for a, for a web-based app, I think that's fine. I think if you're going to a desktop-based app, um, I think there are some other resources that are probably somewhat better. Some of the latest uh, UWP Windows 10 uh, design uh, stuff for 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 the uh, some of the acrylic designs, some of the things that come out of that um, are actually pretty good. So so you got a lot of choices, but there's no, absolutely nothing wrong with using Material Design. Awesome, thank you. Um, if we are, looks like we're having no new questions so far. So, um, let me just take a moment and, uh, let you know that we will have a survey after you exit this webinar and then the same thing after uh, Bill Mooney's session, um, that we'd really encourage you to take. We read through all of the responses from week one. Really grateful for everyone who um, filled that stuff out. Um, and as a sign of our gratitude, we did raffle off a $100 Amazon gift card for everyone who filled out the week one survey. Um, and the winner for that is Chris Blundell. So Chris, um, congratulations. Our team will be in touch to get that gift card to you. And um, for everyone in the audience, we'd encourage you to uh, fill out the survey, uh, both because it helps us be better and because you could win $100. <laughs> um, it looks like we have another question from Tim Laverne. Tim says, should the UX drive the framework or the framework drive the UX? Ooh. Oh, I think the, frame, the, the UX needs to drive the framework. You need to understand what kind of uh, designs, what kind of experience, what kind of platform is going to give the users the best productivity and the fewest errors and fit into their job the best, et cetera. Uh, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to, to, to look at that. That said, though, um, if you've already got a big, big chunk of an app and it's on a framework, now when you when you go to do a new part, now the bar for doing a new framework is pretty high because everybody already knows the old one and the consistency needs to follow. But, but when you are looking especially at shifting platforms, then you really you really want to understand something about the UX. In fact, my process, uh, when I talk about design process, has a step. And the bigger and more complex that the that the design effort is, the more likely it, the step is to be used. It is optional, but it, I recommend it for complex designs. Uh, that step is called visioning, and it's done after going through the business needs and observing the users and analyzing the users and analyzing process flows and things like that. It's done after that. Visioning is basically what what do we need? What kind of technologies could we bring to bear to solve some of these problems? We probably in the business needs section already got a basic idea of the technologies we were going to use. But now let's explicitly take a step and go what's out there in terms of technologies and platforms and frameworks that would fit very nicely into the design goals that we have here. Visioning is typically just a half day of exploration. 
Uh, if you find some good options, maybe another day or so of, of exploring those options and then making some decisions. It doesn't last more than a, a couple of days at the most, but it's explicitly intended to explore that possibility of, of having better fits for the framework than the one that, that you initially thought that you might. I've got a couple of links I'm going to post here. Um, uh, just for resources. What's this one? Oh, um, these are some books on, on design that you're, you're welcome. To. This page has uh, various books on design that you can use as resources. And also I mentioned that LinkedIn course on UX for developers. Here's the link. Whoops. Sorry if I could get my power. So, so there are a couple of links there just to, um, to get those in front of you so you don't have to go casting around for them. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. That's really, really helpful. Um, all right. So wrapping up here, we might have time for one more question. Um, in the meantime, I also wanted to let you know that uh, session recordings from this week's sessions will be sent to you on Monday via email, and they'll be published to our YouTube channel uh, sometime in June. It takes a little bit to you know, edit them and make them presentable for the general public. Uh, we'll send out a marketing e-card uh, to you when they're ready on YouTube, um, but you can expect the raw recordings on Monday. Um, and then one last reminder is we do have our bingo board challenge. And if you've been playing along with that, uh, you'll need to submit them by the end of day on Friday to the classes at synergex.com email uh, in order to be entered to win a prize. So uh, lots of good prize opportunities for you all in the audience. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. So we might just wrap up and give you a couple minutes to get to uh, Bill Mooney's session. But first, I'd like to thank uh, Billy Hollis. You have been absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you very much for yeah imparting it's, your wisdom on us. It's been fun. Thanks to you folks for taking the time to, to, to listen to me today. <laughs>